If we take the Word of God to the 143rd Psalm, we've been doing some of the Psalms on Wednesday nights, and we've been going in order mostly, but occasionally we're skipping ahead, and we're going to the very end of the Psalms tonight to read the 143rd Psalm. And if you found your place, I'll ask you to stand with me as we reverence the Word of God. And we will read all 12 verses of the 143rd Psalm. Psalm 143 says, <clears throat> Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He has smitten my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed. Notice that word, overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee. As a thirsty land, Selah. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. There's a lot of titles we could take, but I like the 10th verse that says, teach me to do thy will. Teach me to do thy will. So let's pray together. Father, help us as we look at your word tonight. And as we just read, would you teach us to do your will? In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. The word overwhelmed is in the scripture, I think it's eight or nine times, and every single time is in the Psalms. The Psalms is a great place to visit when you're overwhelmed. Think of the wonderful psalm that talks about uh, when I'm overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for thou hast been a shelter unto me. It's in the psalm before here. In the 142nd psalm, it says in verse 3, when my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. That's a wonderful thing. As we begin reading our psalm tonight, David begins by saying, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. If you read the psalm before, as we just referenced it, he cried out in 142, and the heading says that this is a prayer when he was in the cave. Have any of you ever been hiding in a cave from your enemies? Literally, no. Maybe figuratively you have. But I don't think any of us literally have. Here's what David said in the cave. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and behold, but there was, and beheld rather, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, no man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name, and righteous, the righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. David now says in this psalm, Hear my prayer, O Lord. We just read the prayer he prayed. He cried to the Lord when he was overwhelmed. 
He asked the Lord to make his path known, to show him the way, to lead him out of the prison, to deliver him. So we're talking about being overwhelmed. And David's prayer is summed up in those words when he was overwhelmed. Teach me to do thy will. When we're overwhelmed, obviously it means there's something bigger than us, something we can't handle. That's literally the best definition I can come up with for being overwhelmed is it's bigger than me. To be overwhelmed means it filled the vessel and it's overflowing. It's overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. And we're going to first of all tonight talk about how David felt. How he felt. Look at the first few verses. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness, answer me. And in thy righteousness. The first thing David feels is that he needs an answer. Have any of you ever needed an answer from God? Anybody here not needing an answer from God? That's what I thought. And he even entreats God's faithfulness. And he treats his righteousness to demand that answer. I need an answer, Lord, because you're faithful. I need an answer because you're righteous. I need an answer. He also felt that he needed mercy because he says, Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. At the same time he asked for an answer, he asked for mercy. Because for God to give us an answer is to give us more than we deserve. You and I are not entitled to have answers. In God's sovereign plan, he doesn't have to tell you what he's doing. I was talking to somebody today about that. I said, I... I've always struggled of how to reconcile the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. What I mean by that is there have been times in my life that I think I made the wrong choice. So was God sovereignly allowing me to make the wrong choice? And how, what, where do you go from there after you've made the wrong choice and now you're trying to find God's will? How do you find it if you were never supposed to be where you are? And I got some good advice, I think. The person said, well, that's where we have to lean on God's grace. When you may have missed his will and you may have made a wrong choice, you need his mercy, you need his grace. And David, in the middle of saying, I need an answer because you're faithful and right, he says, but don't judge me because in your sight, in your judgment, no man living can be justified. In the same prayer of asking God for an answer and asking him for all these things, he has to entreat God's mercy. Because in God's righteousness, he's not going to give you an answer. Even in his faithfulness, he's not going to give you an answer. I can be a faithful father, but not give an answer to everything my children ask. So he's asking for God's mercy, not his judgment. He says in verse 3, For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. He has smitten my life down to the ground. He has made me to dwell in darkness as those that have been long dead. David says, I feel like I've been dead for a long time and I've been buried. He says, I feel dead. I feel buried. I feel that the enemy has persecuted me. My enemy has buried me. They've smitten my life to the ground. I'm in darkness. I'm in a grave like somebody who's been dead for a long time. Quite literally, David's saying, I feel dead. I feel buried. I feel forgotten. I feel overwhelmed. And that's where he says in verse 4, Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. David's in a cave, and back then it was common to bury people in caves. No wonder he feels like he's in a grave. Of course, you see the spiritual figure there, that David in a cave, which could have been a grave, is asking God to be delivered from the grave. And it was the son of David who was buried in a cave and came walking out of the grave. And God did deal with Jesus Christ faithfully and righteously because in God's sight, the judgment of Jesus Christ was he could withstand. He was righteous. So we see a great picture of the resurrection even here. But in the literal interpretation of it, not the gospel representation, David says, I feel overwhelmed. So now we need to ask, how does David react? I, I would argue that David did not always react right. I mean, he is the man that murdered somebody and committed adultery. 
David did make some mistakes. So I think it's pretty fair that at the times that David was overwhelmed, he didn't always sing, Great is thy faithfulness and rock of ages cleft for me. I wonder if he lost his temper. I wonder if he said something he would regret. I wonder if he got in a fetal position and cried like a baby. Probably. I'd say that's a safe assumption. But in the psalm, we do read how he reacts. And we're talking about teaching, the Lord teaching us to do his will when we're overwhelmed. What I, what I observe in these next few verses is the right response. He says, I remember the days of old. I remember the days of old. Maybe God's not giving me an answer right now. Maybe God is not showing me great victories now. But I remember when he has. And David says, I remember the days of old. Now, I can't always live off of what God did. But there are times that I really need to remember what God has done. He says, I meditate on all thy works. Not only does he remember it, but he's dwelling on it. Paul tells us to take every thought into captivity. Paul tells us to, well, the Psalms tell us that we are to meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. To delight ourselves in the law of the Lord. I think every sermon for the last month I've mentioned the first psalm because it's important. We're told in the 19th psalm, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God. We're told here that David meditated on all of God's works. All of them. The things he understood, the things he did not understand, the things he liked, the things he might not have liked, the things that were hard, the things that were easy, the things that were clear, the things that were not clear. He meditated on the works of God. And then he says, I, mur I, excuse me, I muse on the work of thy hands. That word muse is kind of interesting. I did some research on that word muse. That's not a word we use a lot. Muse is kind of like meditate, but it's a little deeper. Muse is kind of like remember. But it's a little deeper. Muse implies more than just remembering and meditating. But muse is almost a poetic use of memories, a poetic use of words and remembering and meditating. You hear of an amusement, something that is meant to be enjoyable, something that satisfies your emotions and your energy. To muse quite literally is to sing. I remember the days, so the seasons. Well, I said, I remember the days. I remember the times where God was working and doing wonderful things. I meditate on your works, on all of them. All the things he's done, I'm thinking about what he's done. And the natural result is musing on the work of his hands. Quite literally, David said, when I'm feeling overwhelmed... I need to remember the seasons. I need to meditate on your works. And I need to muse on the work of your hands. He's saying, I, I sing about it. Muse implies even humming. There's been some science about humming and how it affects your, your mental health, how it affects your emotional health. That if you're having negative thoughts, and here I am, I'm going to get a little bit of Dr. Phil Billy with you tonight. If you're having negative thoughts, that's a one surefire way to get your thoughts off the negative is to hum. To hum. Doesn't even say what you have to hum, but humming will even get your mind off of negativity. I mean, try it. Try to hum and think something negative. It's kind of hard because when you begin to think negative, you stop humming. And when you're humming, you can't think negative. So, you know, you're humming. <laughs> I'm forcing myself to muse on the work of his hands. Then he says, I stretch forth my hands unto thee. This is not a, uh, a, a spiritual, this is a physical stretching. I, 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 let me rephrase. It is spiritual. 
But when he says, I stretch forth my hand, he's talking about bringing even his flesh into the equation. Because that's all in your spirit, to remember the days of old, to meditate on your works, to muse on the work of your hands, is all in your spirit and your soul. But then he says, I'm not only bringing my soul into remembering God, but I'm stretching my hands out to God. Something I told my wife today, I really struggled today because some of the kids were extra clingy today. I wasn't able to get some things done I was trying to get done because they just wanted me all day long. My wife went and ran an errand and I watched the kids for a little while by myself. And I told her everything I planned to do while you were gone did not get done because every time I go to do something, they were stretching forth their hands and I had to keep picking them up and keep picking them up. And I'm complaining about it, but at the same time, it was wonderful at the same time. But yet, we can stretch our hands out to God and He's actually able to still do His work and to hold us at the same time. One reason I know evolution is not true is if it was true, then mothers would have at least three arms. At least. God is able to hold you and work. You and I are not so much able to do that. Then I stretch forth my hands. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. So in his spirit he remembers, in his flesh he stretches, but in his soul he's thirsting. Jesus speaks about thirsting. We talked about it a few Lord's days ago where Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is a thirsting, a desire, he says, after thee. Yes, he asked God to give him an answer. Yes, he's asking God for direction, but quite literally, he just wants to be with him. Again, today, I kept trying to, this is what bothered me. I kept trying to figure out what the kids wanted. They kept wanting me all day long. And I, do you, oh, do you just want this? You want this? You want this? And finally, Leland was the one that said, he said, Dad, I just want you to hold me. He just wanted me. And I was trying to figure out ways to satisfy him and pacify him, if you will, and that's not what he wanted. And I think the Lord taught me something there. That God is not up there just waiting to put a pacifier in my mouth or I'll stop complaining. He wants me to want him. Is it time for the invitation? Sila, it says. I don't know why we don't do that when we read the Psalms. It says the sila means to stop and think about it. Stop and think about it. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. I stretch forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land. Think about it. Lastly, we see the result, how David felt, how he reacted, <clears throat> which, by the way, that's how we should react. When we're overwhelmed, we need to remember, we need to meditate, we need to muse, we need to stretch forth our hands and thirst after God. What's the result of that? Well, in verse 7, he reminds of the urgency of the need because he says, Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. He's kind of jumping back on what he said in verse 3. Verse 3 feels like he's in a grave. Here he says, I really need you to answer me now, God, speedily. Uh, my spirit faileth. Everything I'm doing is failing. And he says, Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down into the pit. Here he is talking like he's in a grave again. Or even worse, they that go down into the pit implies the eternal damnation of hell. So what was the result of David remembering, meditating, musing, stretching, and thirsting? He says, deliver, or excuse me, verse 8, cause me. Now, I'm going to read all these last verses really quickly, and I want you to see if you see something that's common. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. 
for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy cut off mine enemies. Destroy all them that afflict my soul, for I am thy servant. The key is in those last words where he says, For I am thy servant. This closing of the psalm is all the things that God must do because David's already said, my spirit faileth. My spirit fails. I am your servant. I can't do any of it. I'm overwhelmed. I can't. I have to stop. So since I'm overwhelmed and I can't do anything, here's all the things where God is the one who must act because David is failing. My spirit fails. I cannot. He says, cause me to hear. Hearing is a natural thing. Something that if you can't hear, hear that's a sign of bad health. I mean, you, you should be able to hear. But you realize sometimes we can hear, but we, we just can't hear. We're not talking about a physical ability to hear. We're talking about an ability to comprehend. And that's why Jesus would say, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Is God opening up your ears that you're retaining, that you're Getting the message. Cause me to hear what? Thy loving kindness in the morning. You can get up in the morning and you can look out and you can complain about the fog or you can complain about this or the traffic or this or that. But he's asking God to cause me to slow down and actually hear his loving kindness in the morning. To actually recognize the work of his hands. To recognize his mercy in the morning, which, by the way, every morning is new mercy. Somebody, I asked somebody at work the other day, I said, well, what's new? He said, God's mercy, because it's a new morning. That's true. Cause me to hear. Then he says, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. I don't know the way I should go, but he can cause us to know. He has to cause us to know. You and I aren't smart enough to know. My spirit fails. I can't, so he must. He says in verse, lost my place, calling me to know the way I'm where I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. This lifting up implies a surrender. When he stretched forth his hands, he's saying, you must cause me to hear. You must cause me to know. I'm just lifting it up and letting go because I can't. Then he says, deliver me. Again, he's overwhelmed. You can't deliver yourself. So deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. Remember he said, I lift up my soul unto thee. Now he says, I flee unto thee to hide me. He's not just lifting up the soul to God and surrendering, but now he's running to him and hiding. He's literally hiding behind God. Then he says, teach me to do thy will. Teach me. Frankly, David's whole experience of hiding in the cave was to teach him. Think about everything David went, with, went through with Saul. Hiding in a cave from Saul. Forty years later, he's hiding in a cave from Absalom. You and I can see the big picture and see, well, God allowed Saul to persecute David so he could teach him what to do when he was persecuted by Absalom. He had two enemies that used common methods, and David had to hide in both cases. You and I are able to see how God was teaching David, but yet we're not able to see how God is teaching us. God is teaching us as well. I can kind of see it. I can look back at my first church and see how God was using that to teach me things for the second church. And I can look at this and see how he taught me that for this. But I don't see the whole thing like I should, so I have to stop and say, God, teach me to do thy will. Because he says, for thou art my God. Now he's focusing again on who God is. For thou art my God, thy spirit is good. I mean, this is not deep theology. We're not, we're not digging into the deep realms of doctrine right here. We're quite literally making a statement. He's our God and he's a good God. His spirit is good. So teach me to do thy will. Since he is God and he has a good spirit and he's right, 
We need him to teach us what is right. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Lead me. You and I aren't smart enough to figure it out. We need him to lead us. Here's the big one, verse 11. Quicken me, O Lord. For thy name's sake, for thy righteousness sake, bring my soul out of trouble. I was talking again to somebody today about how hard it is to get life into people that just seem dead. And the statement I made was, how can you get people to wake up and see the beauty of Christ, the beauty of His Word, and how can you get people to change? And I said it, 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 it would be equivalent to the resurrection of Jesus Christ to get some people to change from their dead state. And as I said it, it hit me that that is exactly the point. That's what the gospel is. It is the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. That the same gospel, the same power that raised Jesus from a grave and now he lives evermore is the same power you and I experience when we come to Christ and he regenerates us and we are born again and we are a new creation. That is the point. It would, it will, it, the only way for this church to be a thriving, healthy church in Topeka, Kansas is if the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ quickens the soul of man. That's why David says, Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. Now, I'm focusing on the gospel, but of course David is talking about his restoration so here's the conclusion now. And of thy mercy cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul for I am thy servant. Here's what's interesting. David invokes the mercy of God and in his mercy he asks God to cut off people. That cutting off means to strike them down. To kill them. If I cut off a snake, I killed it. If I cut off an enemy, they're dead. And in David asking for God's mercy, he asked for judgment on the wicked. You realize the goodness of God means nothing without the judgment of God. That at salvation, we are literally saved from God's wrath. And you and I would have nothing to sing about tonight if it wasn't for the fact that there are enemies that will be cut off. And it is the same God... You say, are you saying the same God that uh, raises us to new life cuts off the enemy? That's exactly what the Bible's saying. It's the same God. That the same all-loving, all-powerful God will cut off the enemies. That's the great problem of evil, they call it. The great philosophical problem of God is all-knowing, all-benevolent, all, all those things, and how does evil happen? They're missing the point. That there is no good without evil. And there is no mercy without judgment. And since all things come from Him, it all does come from Him. So, of thy mercy cut off mine enemies and destroy them that afflict my soul. He finishes by saying, I am thy servant. When he's overwhelmed, he says, here's how I feel. Here's what I need. What I'm going to do is slow down and focus on you. And then here's all these other things that I still need that I can't do, but I'm placing myself at your mercy. The conclusion is, number one, you can't always control how you feel, but sometimes you can. You, you sometimes can control how you feel. Not always, but sometimes you can. If you've been listening to gloom, despair, and agony on me, and you've been hanging out with complaining people, and you, you've, you've allowed things to happen to make you feel depressed, then you shouldn't be surprised when you're depressed. So sometimes you can control how you feel. But let's acknowledge there are times you can't. There are times you're overwhelmed. Number two, even though you can't always control how you feel, you can always control how you react. But only intentionally. And this is coming from the guy who could write the book on how not to react to things. Somebody told me tonight, said, 
I get upset and I take it out on my wife. That's not right. I said, you know what? I did the same thing today. I got upset and I was harsh to her. It wasn't her fault. So when you figure out the answer, let me know because I struggle with it too. Was I wrong? Absolutely. Were you wrong? Absolutely. We're usually wrong. But we don't have to be. We can react right. And then lastly, the true work and solution to these things that overwhelm us can only be solved by God. Only by Him. So when you're feeling overwhelmed, that's when we usually get to the point of saying, God, I've done all I know to do. Now you have to take over. And it's like he's saying, you would have never been overwhelmed if you'd have brought it to me a long time ago. So, as the psalmist writes, teach me to do thy will. Do you know something we, we do at my job when we're teaching people a new position? We put them in a spot. We, we, we have a, a slogan. We... We, show, we tell them, we show them, we let them, we coach them. We tell them this is what the job is. I show them how to do it, and then I start letting them do it, and then I give some advice along the way. But the best way to get them the mastery position is to leave them alone and watch and wait till they're overwhelmed. When they're overwhelmed, I step in and take over so that the whole job isn't a loss. But I, ha I have to let them get overwhelmed. And I have to time it and see how much it takes to get them overwhelmed. And so then later, as we're developing people, learning where they are, somebody will ask, can we put this person on this spot? I say no, because when it gets to the busiest point, they will get overwhelmed. And you know when we sign people off and say they can handle the spot? When they get through the entire rush without me having to step in and fix it. So you know what we do after that? We take them to the next level and to the next spot and we do the same thing again. And it sounds cruel, but that's why we're successful is people are growing and developing and becoming better. But to do that, we have to let them get overwhelmed. And you and I are in the same boat. I'll be the first to say 85% of what I said tonight, I don't like it. But it's in there. And you and I all must remember. We must meditate. We must muse. We must stretch out our hands. And when we're feeling overwhelmed, we have to go to Him and say, Teach me to do Thy will. Because I don't know how. But He does. Father, help us to put this into practice. It's not easy. But it's in the scripture. So we're grateful for your word giving us instruction of how to do thy will. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.